When Graham Burton was sent to prison for the murder of Paul Anderson, the victim's family hoped and prayed that he would be off the streets for good and would therefore be unable to hurt anyone again. This was sadly not the case. In an extreme error of judgment, he was released on parole in 2006, despite being classed as a high-risk offender just two years before. He would subsequently go on a savage and brutal crime spree. This is what happens when an unstable murderer is set free. These are the senseless crimes of Graham Burton. yourself knee deep in a new game just wishing that you could get something extra out of all that playtime well today's video is brought to you by Mistplay, the ultimate loyalty program designed just for you gamers Mistplay isn't your ordinary app it's a gamers of paradise where playing games gets you more than just bragging rights whether you're eyeing up that new amazon gadget craving your daily coffee aiming for the next fortnite battle pass or just about any other treat Misplays got your back. Finding your next favourite game is a breeze with Misplays' massive catalogue. Whether you're into puzzles, strategy, adventure, or anything in between, there's always something new to discover and play. And here's the best part the more you play, the more you earn. That's right, every single minute that you spend in game racks up points that you can redeem for gift cards from top brands like Amazon, Walmart, Xbox, and PlayStation. To date, over $100 million in gift cards have been redeemed. Now, my go-to game with Misplay is Dual Water World, which is this captivating puzzle game set beneath the sea. So players match jewels to clear them, navigating through levels that grow in challenge with strategic moves, special power-ups, and of course, obstacles. So the game offers this really great mix of excitement and strategy. And as players progress, they unlock treasures and explore the ocean's depths, all within a relaxing and engaging underwater adventure. Ready to join the fun? Just click the link in the description to download Misplay for free and sign up today and you'll grab 200 bonus points right off the bat. Plus, use my special code EMMA50 inside the app to get an extra 50 free points. That's a head start on earning your first gift card. Don't miss out on making your game time even more rewarding. Remember, new games and adventures await and they're all just a tap away with Misplay. Thanks for watching and a massive shout out to Misplay for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get back to why you guys are here and get on with today's true crime video. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Whoa, today's case is going to leave you reeling. It's one of those where you just know if the right protocols had gone in place, then these crimes would never have played out the way that they did. But time and time again on my channel, I cover the failures in such cases. And today is an example of a huge failure on an epic level. Also, if you're new to my channel, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Though you may be noticing that we're putting some extra cases up now and then because we're trying to do more content for you guys you ask for it we are trying to come through with it just finding the time also if you fancy getting your hands on one of my the serial killer next door books which is going to be released in september then you can pre-order it just going to put the link down below and if you fancy getting your hand on some chase merch which you asked for then i am wearing and demonstrating how lovely it is there is my gorgeous cat chase and you can order those now. Again, you can look in the description below and there will be links available. Let's get on with today's insane case. It really is. It's one of those that took my breath away and you will understand throughout why that's the case. So let's look at Graham Burton. Let's look at the antagonist in this case. So he was born in 1971. He was born in Lower Hutt in New Zealand. And 
I would say his life didn't start off very easily. He was put up for adoption as a baby and he was actually taken in by an older couple. But I'm sure most of us would agree that on the whole, adoptions work out really effectively and often the child is given a better standard of living from where they would have been born and brought up alternatively. So this should bode well, even though there is some dysfunction initially. But then in 1973, so just a couple of years after he's adopted, his adopted father died. So that's really sad. We're talking about at two years of age, his life changing because he's already been given up by his birth family. He's been taken in by an older couple, which obviously has issues because as you get older, it's more likely that you're going to be on this planet less time than somebody who's younger than you. And I understand that. I have a very young child and I'm an older mom. But you don't expect your father to die just two years into that situation playing out. So he's had the dysfunction initially of being abandoned by his birth family. And then we have his dad dying too. So we can imagine on an attachment level, psychologically, there's going to be some real scars. So at this point, he's left in the care of his adoptive mother. And apparently their relationship was very strange from the get-go, which is kind of unusual on the basis that when you go out of your way to adopt a child, it's usually quite a strenuous process. And I appreciate that in modern day, we have much more strategic processes and much more challenging processes to get through to adopt a child. Certainly in the UK we do. But even back then, you would still expect there to be some rigor around the kind of people you place children with. The fact that she struggles with him, well, we can look at that on a twofold level. First of all, it could just be that maybe she was pressured into the adoption by her husband who then died. And so she has a level of resentment towards the situation. She's now a single parent. That was not what she was expecting. Certainly she gets older and therefore she takes it out on the child. Also, we could say that maybe from the get go, this particular individual is quite a strange child. So it could be that Graham Burton is somebody who from the very beginning struggles to relate and even as a very young child doesn't act accordingly to the expectations of the primary caregiver. I appreciate as a child, that's not your job. You're meant to be brought up and loved no matter what kind of strange behaviours that you exhibit. But certainly I've worked with families who have adopted a child and really struggle to bond. And it's not because they haven't gone over and aboard to try, they end up in therapy because of that, but there is something that is just a little bit off about the child. And it can be that there are just big attachment issues. It can be that there's something else going on. And in this case, it really wouldn't surprise me if there was something really early on in this child's behavior that made it more challenging to connect with him over. So this mother is now a single parent. She's bringing up a child that she probably is struggling with, but also I would say there are things going on with her, aside from the fact that she's going through a grief process. She's lost her husband and that can often make you withdraw. And she would use tactics that were really unfair when she came down to disciplining him. So she'd often threaten to give him back if he was being naughty. And I can compute that this is something that others will have experienced and endured. Even myself, when I was a child, my sister and I used to have this scenario where if we were being a bit naughty, my dad, who honestly was the kindest and most lovely human being in the world, he used to ring Matron Clancy at the girls' home and suggest that she could come and pick us up, which is just bloody ludicrous, isn't it? We used to be like begging him not to send us away. It seems to be a tactic that was something that other people employed to try to get their kids to get in line. And it's quite traumatic. And obviously I belong to my father on a biological level. I can imagine that it would have been even more terrifying if I had been adopted and those kind of silly tactics had been used. Used. So I'm not going to just totally put the mother down here. I do know that this is something that is quite common back in the day, along with physical punishment as well, that this was a way of getting your child in line. But it's not an effective practice. It's traumatic for the child. And particularly given the additional layer of already him being a child who's been abandoned. So that's very emotionally damaging for anyone Never mind a young child. And like I said, the fact that I can recount as a very young kid having those experiences myself, and I was brought up in a non abusive household, but nonetheless, I can say that was something that has stuck with me. And my sister, 
they grew out of it when my brother was born. There's a difference in age. And when he was brought up, he never went through that. This is about people being ill-equipped at the time to discipline children and just thinking that this was a way forward. But like I said, when you're talking about adoptive children, it's going to be very damaging to make them feel that there is a tenuous link to you and one that could be severed at any minute. That would make him feel insecure. It would give him an impression that he just wasn't part of a stable family. And I will note that from my research, it is unclear as to whether she was always like this or whether the attitude towards him changed after her husband's death, which I would think makes sense because she's by herself. She's probably feeling ill-equipped. She's probably struggling with the whole overwhelming experience of bringing up a young child. But it feels that there is something deeper going on where this boy is concerned. So behaviorally, he's problematic from the get-go. By the time that he's 15 years of age, he's regularly drinking, he's taking drugs, he's using LSD, he's using cannabis, he's using prescription pills, including benzodiazepines. He's also breaking into chemists because he thinks that he'll be able to find benzodiazepines at that point to actually steal. And he's often stealing just to be able to afford more drugs. So we're talking about quite a high level dependency for the age of 15, and that's graduated. So he's obviously going to have started earlier. And the problem with that is the brain is developing all the way up until 25 years of age. So if you're putting something into your body at an early age, then it's going to have an impact and it's going to fracture those foundations further. And where Graham Burton is concerned, he already has some pretty extensive fractures, both in his background, his upbringing and in his behaviour. So we're genuinely adding fuel to the fire when we consider the impact that these drugs are going to have. And the fact that he's using LSD, which is clearly something that's going to be hallucinogenic and at quite a high level, and then he's using benzodiazepines, I would imagine, to deal with the coming down and going to sleep because LSD can keep you up for hours and hours and hours and you want to end the trip. And he's adding other drugs to this scenario. So he's in a situation where he wants to escape reality and is finding ways to do so. And then once he's dealt with the high of the LSD and he wants to get some sleep, the benzodiazepines are helping him manage the come down and giving him that much needed sleep. But that's a big problem. It's when you think about benzodiazepines and by the age of 17, he's using these drugs, by the way, daily. These kind of things, such as diazepam, they're usually described for anxiety. So they're very effective, like I said, if you're coming down from a drug and you just need to crash, you want to sleep. And if you were just doing that occasionally, the damage is going to be limited. But on a daily level, it is really going to affect every inch of your being. And like I said, it's certainly going to be having a dramatic impact on the developing brain. But to be having that on a daily basis, because usually those drugs are released to you by a doctor for a short period of time for anxiety, and they do calm you without a doubt, but the problem is they calm you for a very short period of time. They are incredibly addictive. And because we have this cooking pot of possibility and problems here, which is that he's got frequent drug use, this is massively concerning for his age, and we also have this long-term misuse of drugs and alcohol, and that's actually associated with violent behaviour. It can also lead to mental health problems, particularly in teenagers who have upset, whose brains are still developing, but also what we're seeing when people are long-term using these anxiety release drugs, we see what's known as the rebound effect. So the rebound effect is you take a really effective anxiety manager such as diazepam. Now, there's no doubt whatsoever if you were to take a pill like that and you're feeling anxious, over a period of hours from taking that tablet, you will start to feel calmer. And that's great. You know, it gives you a release from the anxiety that you're feeling. And who wants to feel anxiety? It's horrible. It gives you a sense of dread, an internalized sense of constant fear. You're on high alert. And suddenly... Even though none of the problems have changed and everything that you're dealing with is still present, you feel more chilled. And if that was all it did, then all well and good. But it doesn't. It creates the rebound effect, as I've said. And the rebound effect is you will take those anxiety drugs for a short period of time. And then 
the minute that you come off them, boy, that anxiety that you thought you had, imagine it 10 times worse. The rebound effect is so self-correcting that it self-corrects in an over-correction way. And suddenly you are dealing with this really horrific level of anxiety. So in the long term, you end up facing more anxiety than you had before, which is obviously a big problem when you're already struggling. And even if you're somebody who's just using these drugs to chill out after getting high, it's still going to have the same impact. You're going to have the rebound effect where you are suddenly going to be facing anxiety and you're going to want to stop that because it feels awful. So you're going to take more. Sometimes you're going to double the dose and then we have a real catastrophe unfolding. Now, some people, of course, will take these tablets correctly in the right doses, in the right short space, and they'll be okay. I get that. But let me tell you, we have a big problem with these kind of addictions. This is why we see big issues in areas where new drugs are released and they have this instantaneous, miraculous impact on changing the way somebody feels for the better. But then when they come off them, it is intolerable to manage. And then we see people becoming addicted and going out of their way to see lots of different doctors, buying them illegally on the dark web and so on and so forth. So he's got a big problem. At the age of 21, he has been in trouble with the police on multiple occasions. He actually has 91 convictions of fraud for property crime and for drug-related offences. And that's introducing us to a real fractured personality. This is somebody who does not work consequentially. This is not somebody who gets a slap on the wrist and is like, probably need to change my behavior because I'm getting in trouble. This is a repeat offender of the highest level. And when we see somebody acting in this way, yes, one can say, well, maybe it's because he's an addict, but we're talking about somebody who's doing fraud, who's getting involved in property crime and as well drug related offenses. So it's across the board. It's not just going and stealing to get money for drugs. It's somebody who's happy to engage in lots of different types of crime, which are unrelated at time to the drug use. So this is giving us more insight into potentially a higher level and social personality disorder. Now, at the time that he's 21, he also has a 15-year-old girlfriend. She's a girl called Kelly Kirk. Now, six years when you are 21 is a big deal. When you are 15, you are really quite innocent, naive, no matter how grown up you think you are. And when you're with a 21-year-old guy, you are out of your depth. It's a strange dynamic to have such an age gap at that time. She's underage and she's arguably vulnerable because... If she was 30 and he was 36, we wouldn't be talking about this, but it's a massive difference maturity-wise when you are talking about the age gap at this presence when she's 15 and he's 21. Also, you won't be surprised to know that he's violent towards Kelly and the way that he manages his relationship with her is that if she dares to consider leaving him, well, he basically says, I'm going to kill you. Romance isn't dead where Graham Burton is concerned, is it? But that's the kind of high-level threat that she receives when she just considers removing herself from a domestically violent situation. And on one occasion, he actually left her chained to a bed for two days. This is such a high level of domestic abuse. I mean, her life genuinely is in danger. When somebody is acting in that manner, this is somebody who has no boundaries and it's also somebody who sees you as property. And again, when we think about the antisocial personality mindset, that's how an individual would approach people in their lives. That they are territorial based and ownership based, therefore you are in my life, therefore I own you. And chaining her to the bed that way, aside from clearly preventing her to leave of her own volition, in spite of the fact that she's obviously going to have had problems when it came down to her own sanitation in that situation, aside from having to deal with her own psychological trauma, the message that he's given her is you belong to me. I will do with you whatever I see fit. And when you have somebody with that mindset, you know that your life genuinely is at risk. And she hasn't got the emotional maturity or the relational experience to manage this situation in a way that will make sense to other people who may look in and think, what on earth is going on for her? Why isn't she doing something about it? She isn't somebody who has the capacity. She's never been in a relationship of this nature before and she doesn't know how to get out. And even though for most of us looking in, we're thinking, come on, being chained to a bed for two days, you need to go to the police station. When you have somebody who's so dominating, so powerful, so coercive, so physically threatening and abusive over you, you don't believe that the authorities are going to be able to do very much for you. 
These people will convince you that they will find you and kill you if you dare to imagine you can be free of them. So you are completely trapped, both in a physical prison in this case, of being chained to a bed, and in a psychological prison where you truly believe this person who is harming you is all powerful. And add to that the layer that you might love them, even though it's a bad love on top of that. It's a very challenging position to find yourself in. Kelly actually said that he had said to her during the relationship that he knew he would eventually kill somebody and she believed that that was a given. She didn't know whether it was going to be her, but she definitely knew that at some point he was going to kill someone. And the fact that he's saying that to her demonstrates again a practicing, a rehearsing for what's going to go on in the future. Because when you start to consider an action, most of us will close it down in our thoughts. So most of us will have, shall we say, inappropriate thoughts occasionally. I do set people on fire in my head occasionally, but I shut it down. It's not like I think, hmm, I had that idea about setting fire to that individual. I'll just pop to the shops and grab myself some gasoline and some matches. You know, you go, that's not okay. I'm just going to allow that intrusive thought and I'm going to let it go. But when you start talking about, so if I was then going and seeing my husband and saying, somebody has really upset me and I imagine setting them on fire in my head. And now I think I'm probably going to do it. I'm practicing, I'm rehearsing, I'm giving myself a level of confidence, I'm making it more normalized. And even though at that point, ideally it would be closed down because somebody would bring me to my senses. What I'm saying is the more that you start bringing that into reality, the more you start conceiving that you have the potential, the more likely you are to actually gain enough confidence to move through those actions into reality. So when his girlfriend talked about how he would act in her relationship with him, she would say that he was genuinely a psychopath. She said that it's the most accurate description of Burton because one of the things that she noted about him from early on in their relationship is that she understood that he imitated emotions. And of course, we all know that psychopaths imitate emotions. She said he doesn't know how to portray emotions, so he imitates what he sees around him. And there are psychopaths out there, particularly corporate psychopaths, who are bright enough to realize there is something broken in them. There is something untoward about the way they behave. They will practice what another human being acts like. They will try to imitate them because they realize that they should seem to play a role in accordance to how the world around them expects that role to be played. And because it's not authentic, because it is indeed a mask they're wearing, they have to practice at times. And I don't want to be negative towards Kelly, by the way, because, you know, when you have been in an abusive relationship, you are more vulnerable and predators will often sniff you out and know that you're an easier target. But it does seem that even when her relationship with Burton had broken down, that cycle of finding men who were really bad for her continued. So her daughter, Daryl, she was convicted of manslaughter for the 2015 shooting of Adam Watkins, who Kelly had been in a relationship with at the time. So Adam had allegedly been high on drugs and he was swinging a cleaver around at people who was breaking car windows in the process. And Daryl at this point felt that they were all at risk. So she claimed to have shot him in self-defense and she shot six times with three bullets hitting him. Apparently Adam was very violent and abusive towards Kelly and her daughter just got to a point where she broke. But it intrigues me how we see women who deserve so much more ending up with violent predators time and time again. It's as if these individuals can just see the vulnerability that those women walk with and they exploit it. And Kelly was certainly an individual who was exploited on numerous occasions. And also the fact that her daughter acts in that way and manner, you can imagine the trauma that her daughter has been through growing up and probably seeing her mother repeatedly abused. And she got to the point where she wasn't taking it anymore. So to some degree, she overcorrects by shooting and killing that man because she's borne witness to the abuse throughout the ages. Now, in 1992, Burton gets kicked out of a Wellington nightclub called The Car Park. It's on Willis Street. And the reason that he gets kicked out is because he urinates on the floor. I mean, when it comes down to nightclub behavior, that is pretty unusual. 
Don't get me wrong, vomiting on the floor, that seems to be quite a common occurrence, but it's unusual that somebody just decides to have a waz on the dance floor. It brings in a whole new dynamic to such an environment, doesn't it? And understandably, the bouncers are like, oh, that's not okay, You're not going to be allowed to do that. That's not this kind of club. You want to find a very specialist kind of club for that kind of action. So anyway, understandably, Burton's not happy because he doesn't want to throw it out of anywhere because he's a very antisocial human being. So he starts kicking off with security at the club over this, and then he's still not happy. But bear in mind, when you think about security, when you think about bouncers, they tend to be, I don't know, quite burly. Not all. I appreciate it. Not everyone is quite burly as a bouncer. I've seen very petite females who are bouncers, although that worries me a little bit, ladies. It really does because, you know, I'm just going to say, if you're a petite woman, even if you're the toughest girl in the world, a big guy's punch is going to knock you out. But anyway, this is the way of the world and I'm not saying it's a terrible thing. But when you come down to people like Burton, security are probably going to be in this situation quite big, quite burly, also quite unit based because let's be honest, they tend to work together. And so you get big guys working to evict people from clubs who are pretty handy with their punches and also they work together. So there's more than one person on you at a time. But he is probably going to look at that and think, I'm not going to take on these guys because the chances are I'm going to have my nose broken. But he's still really angry. So he ends up approaching a guy called Paul Anderson. So Paul Anderson just works as a lighting technician at the club. So this is a guy who's clearly not thinking about having a fight with anyone. He's not physically in a scenario where he's ready for any kind of altercation because he's a lighting technician. He doesn't deal with the security. That's what the bouncers do. And his job is to just make sure that the lights in the actual club work well and that everyone's having a good time because of those things that we all expect to see at clubs, which is lovely light shows. So at this point, Burton asks Paul, who is just going about his business, if he worked there. And Paul obviously just says, yeah. But bear in mind, Burton is somebody who'll be really unhappy about the fact that the bouncers have told him he's got to get out. You know, basically... He's not going to be able to carry on his night and he feels that somebody is dared to have power over him. So he's looking to exert control elsewhere. So as soon as Paul says yes, Burton just viciously stabs him and he stabs him with a 10 centimetre knife. So bear in mind, he's gone out armed. He's obviously prepared to carry out these kind of attacks. And it was said that he stabbed Paul so hard that Paul was literally lifted into the air with the force of that being stabbed. And understandably, when you think about the severity of such a stabbing, it doesn't surprise you to know that Paul bled out and just died due to that blood loss. Now, when they arrested Burton, it turns out he was reportedly under the influence of six different drugs. So this included LSD and benzodiazepines. He'd also been drinking tequila in addition to this. So one could say, well, maybe there was a level of psychosis, you know, and you are drug induced to such a degree. That is a possibility. But we have to remember that somebody like Burton has been drinking and taking drugs and taking high levels of LSD and marijuana for a very long time. So the chances are that he's quite used to this situation, he's quite used to this level of drinking and drug use. So it's more likely that he is aware of what he's done and he wanted to do it. That's why he went out with that 10 centimetre knife. And like I said, the person he picks to kill as well, that doesn't sound like it's random. That sounds like it's very specific. He didn't want to take on security, but of course, taking on somebody that represents the club and then projecting all his anger out onto him, that makes sense to him. So like I said, I'm not going to give in to this idea that he's having a psychotic break. I think he's purposeful. I think he's got his victim profile. He's absolutely armed and he's willing to take action in this circumstance. So when he's tried, Burton is actually sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Paul with the possibility of parole after 10 years, which I think is so lenient. Why bother? We're talking about a young man being murdered, no provocation whatsoever, by a man who was armed and who was so violent that this guy was stabbed at such a rate that apart from bleeding guy, he was literally lifted off the floor. We're talking about a man with an absolute propensity 
for further crimes because he's got 91 previous offences and now he's killed someone. And yet they give him, yes, a sentence to life, but the possibility of parole after 10 years. I mean, is life that cheap that you would ever be allowed to walk the streets again after 10 years for such a heinous crime? Understandably, Kelly sees Burton's incarceration as, I don't know, a little bit of light in the darkness. So she breaks up with him when he served about a year of his sentence. So even then, she stayed with him for a period of time. And I would imagine that's because she's so controlled. She's so convinced of his power that even though he's locked up and literally can't leave his cell, she probably still believes that his power is all over. It's omnipresent. And if she does anything, something terrible will happen to her. So it probably takes her a year to decontaminate herself from that relationship. And when she tells him, he is absolutely enraged by this. You know, how dare she imagine even for a moment that she can be free of him. So he actually sends her a letter. And in that letter, he wrote, I am coming for you. Revenge will be sweet. So even though he's locked up, even though he's the one who's put himself in that position, he believes that she should be devoted to him, even though he is going to be potentially in prison for life. Yes, he might get out after 10 years, but the point is there is a potential that he's going to be there if he doesn't behave well, etc. for far longer. Yet he expects a young woman to give up her life for him. Could you be any more narcissistic? Could you be any more delusional in your expectation of other human beings? And yeah, we can track back and say, well, maybe part of this stems from the abandonment issues that he's endured because of his birth parents giving him up and then his father dying as far as the adoptive father dying and then the mother in the adoptive circumstance rejecting him could it be that the only way he can cling on to people is through threatening them and his desperate fear of abandonment is why he's threatening her but i think no i think that graham burton is bad throughout he's been born bad he is bad He's acting bad because it is second nature to him. So I don't believe it's the abandonment issues personally. I believe it's his personality, it's his temperament, it's his hardwired self. It's who he truly is. That's who thinks it's okay to threaten somebody to remain in your life. I mean, it's as far away from love as it could possibly be. Now we get to June 1998. Burton well, he's not really changing his ways because along with three other inmates, he literally manages to escape from Paramormo prison. So they were on the run for 11 days, which is horrendous when you think about the high level crime that he was involved in that got him incarcerated in the first place. To get away for 11 days, the amount of damage that could have played out is horrifying. And Kelly, his now ex, she had to go into hiding with her children whilst he was free because she believed that her life was going to be in danger and after all he'd written to her and said that he would come for her so there's a strong possibility that she is at risk now after a search which did involve over 100 police officers burton was caught and at this point he's sentenced to another three years in prison which i think is pretty light we're talking about somebody needing to take responsibility and accountability for their actions they've escaped which means that they genuinely don't think that they should be in prison i'm just not i'm just not going to stay I'm just going to leave. I'm going to leave because I don't like it here. So I think I'm just going to go and free myself. At that point, you're like, this person doesn't get it. Maybe double his sentence. We get to 1999, and at this point, Burton's adoptive mother dies. Now, it's hard to say whether this would have had much of an impact on him. Let's be honest, his behaviour was already off the charts, and by all accounts, they didn't seem to have a positive relationship, but it's just worth noting that that did happen in 1999. Then we get to 2004. So at this point, the parole board consider that he's going to be likely an individual who would re-offend if he were released. And we're like, yes, he does sound like that, doesn't he? I think if we just look at his history and his mass amount of offending before he was incarcerated for murder, and then we think about his behaviour in prison when he tried to escape and actually indeed did escape and spent 11 days on the run and cost an inordinate amount of money trying to find him, it does make sense that he would be likely to re-offend if he were released. Now, even though in 2004 that happens, he has, during his incarceration, had to attend the Violence Prevention Unit. And the whole premise of this Violence Prevention Unit is indeed with the idea of aiming to lower the risk of re-offending. 
But when he was attending this violence prevention unit, he didn't actually have to undertake any counselling for his drug use. So that's strange because you would imagine that somebody would be like, well, I'm just going to... It's going to throw it out there. I mean, I think we've got real problems with this guy, but I think that one of the underlying factors that causes him to act, shall we say, reprehensibly, could be the drug dependency issues. And I think maybe if we could get to the root of some of that, we might not stop him being a bad guy, but we could potentially prevent some of the most gratuitous actions of this individual. You'd think that that might just come into play, but apparently not. Apparently the... Uh, risk of re-offending and the violence unit that was all about lowering that risk, they just didn't consider that to be priority, which is, like I said, a little bit concerning. Just going to throw it out there. So then we get to 2005. So bear in mind the kind of guy we're talking about. Bear in mind in 2004, the parole board are like, mm, let's just consider whether it would ever be sensible to let this guy out because we worry about him. In 2005, it turns out that there is a change. And in this 12 months, this 12 months since what I've just said occurred and played out, the parole board is really impressed with his progress. And they said, quote, his conduct has been impeccable. Impeccable, literally a word that nobody would associate with Burton. But apparently, just go with me on this. This is what they're thinking in 2005. That is behavior is impeccable. But unfortunately for him, he can't be released at this point because it was a requirement that he had some escorted releases because escorted releases obviously would allow the staff to see what his behavior was like outside the prison. And so when you're going to have parole, it's important to see how you fit back into society. And this hadn't played out. So because these hadn't been completed, and of course that isn't Burton's fault, one of the things that they wanted was for him to have another psychological assessment. So they're in a halfway house, you know, they want him to get out, which is bizarre, but they also want to make sure that the right decision happens when you consider the fact that he is a high risk offender. So then in June of 2006, there's a parole board hearing because they decide, have we got it right now? Should he be released? Bear in mind at this point, he's only served 14 years of his sentence, which I think is negligible when you consider what Paul's family will have had to go through. Shockingly, and you're not going to be surprised because you're not going to say, the outcome of this hearing was that he was to be released on life parole. So apparently this was based on the improvement of his behaviour, even though there was actually an alleged incident that he'd been involved in, but they didn't give them details of this particular event because there was no evidence to back it up. So even though I can't tell you what that event was, I can tell you that my assumption, just using a bit of, I don't know, logic, common sense, just stating the obvious, it would be, has he been involved in an incident? Oh, I don't know. Apparently he's been involved in an alleged, alleged incident. But do you think it's real? Well, I don't know, because it's only an alleged incident. When you look at the background of this individual, could it be that the alleged incident could suggest that maybe he did actually get involved in that incident because when we look at back at his history, he had so many, I mean, over a hundred offences basically, and he's killed somebody. Would it make sense that maybe it's not an alleged incident and that it is an actual incident that we should consider? All I'm saying is he's had impeccable behaviour and therefore I'm imagining that this alleged incident, it's just alleged. It's just an allegation. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how all crimes begin. You know, somebody commits one, there's an allegation and then they're found guilty. But we're just going to, we're just going to go with the impeccable. It feels more reasonable. If I agree. I agree, Maureen. It feels more reasonable that this man, who's a prolific offender, who's never changed his ways, who literally murders somebody, is likely to have just been impeccable impeccable. You're right. I don't even know why I'm worried about it. Let's just, let's just free him. Anyway, apparently that's the case. They were like, oh no, his baby's been really good. So let's just like forget that. And I just want to throw in here at this moment in time, why do I think that is absolutely insane? Why do I think that is crazy? Why do I think that Maureen and Janet on the parole board had been drinking a little bit of gin at dinner time and were feeling a little 
bit happier than they should have been during that meeting. I'm not saying that that happened. I don't even know who the pro board officers were. All I'm saying is, how has his behaviour been impeccable when he literally broke out of prison during his sentence? I mean, genuinely, when somebody has literally escaped from prison, how does it compute that they are somebody who's been impeccable, you know? Can you just describe how Graham Burton has been doing? Because we need to consider whether he's going to be okay to be freed. Oh, I can indeed. He's done really well. Really? So there's no bumps in the road? I mean, it, it depends what you would consider bumps to be. I mean, if you would consider a bump to be a small molehill, maybe, maybe you would consider the bump. But if you were to consider that a bump could be an enormous mountain, imagine Mount Everest, maybe bigger, and you just go, well, that's just a bump in the road. Well, then Graham Burton's done great. It's just a bump in the road. Oh, okay. And what kind of progress has he made? Well, let me tell you. It's all about perception, isn't it? It's all about the way that you look at something. So one of the things that we noted about Graham Burton is that he's been absolutely amazing at setting goals. Oh, goal setting's wonderful. I know. Also, he's been a team player. So he's very good at working with others to affect a change that in the long term will benefit him and the others. Oh, I like somebody who sets goals and who's a team player. I mean, that's really important for the parole board to hear. I know. And also one of the things that we connect with him over is his dedication to a common goal, a common purpose, and how his life he wishes to live in a way that he feels is going to benefit himself and those others. Well, he seems really safe. So what incidents or experiences or bumps in the roads are we talking about when we talk about what you've just said? We're talking about him trying to escape from prison and then actually managing to escape from prison and then going with another two people out of prison and going on the run for 11 days because they wanted to live their life differently. Right. I see what you're there. I see what you did there, yeah. Yeah. I suppose there was a goal and he did get engaged with team playing and I suppose that he did know that he wanted a different life. So uh, I'll just write impeccable. I'll write impeccable on here, honestly. Just, mm. Anyway, this is what happens. So yeah, despite the fact that he'd broken out of prison during his sentence, he was still considered an appropriate person to be freed. So apparently this parole was meant to be carefully managed and we all know what carefully managed release under close supervision can end up being, which is not managed at all. But this decision was basically reached despite the fact that one of the board's requirements hadn't even been met. So remember what I said about making sure that they were looking at how he was coping in society. So doing those observed visits out they hadn't taken place, but more importantly, he hadn't actually been eased back into the community at all. So there hadn't been a series of home leaves, which obviously gives the officers an opportunity to see how they cope, but also sees whether they start reoffending, etc., sees whether they start drinking or taking drugs. None of that had actually occurred. And the probation service actually advised the police that he was going to be released in advance because they were actually really worried about who he was. So the probation services are not necessarily on the same page with the parole board. They think he is a really high risk offender and that the police need to be aware. Now it's shocking to me that somebody who clearly is dangerous could ever have been released like this. The very fact that the police need to be informed that he's coming back into society, it speaks for itself. How could anyone let it happen? And Paul's sister, of course, who is the victim's sister, who's had to live her life without a brother, Janet had actually spoken against Burton's release at his hearing, saying that she believed he would absolutely reoffend if he was going to be let out of prison. She said, if Burton is released, the same pain will be released on a whole new set of people. She said, this cannot happen again. She said, this cannot happen again. She said, we cannot have another offender on parole, hit the piss and then go on a rampage. And I totally understand and connect with that. She's right. She's predicting the future, essentially. She said, convince me 
that if Graham Burton is released, he will not take drugs again and reoffend. Convince me that it is not going to end in tears all over again. She was also really concerned that his parole conditions didn't actually include attending any Alcoholics Anonymous or any Narcotics Anonymous, which, again, is blindsiding and completely insane. This man is a high-level dependent. Why would you not be checking on whether he's engaging in drugs or alcohol? Because, obviously, that was something that they will have looked at in his prior conviction and seen could have been something that exacerbated his murderous actions. So you want to prevent him being engaged in that kind of of opportunity. Now, despite her warnings on the 10th of July 2006, he was, of course, indeed set free from prison, and her words would eerily foreshadow the unfortunate but entirely predictable events that followed his release. And it's so frustrating because we should not ever have to sit and cover a case where we know the future. We can see, we can predict it because the past has indicated what we needed to know. We have been schooled in what will play out if someone like Graham Burton ever walks the streets again. So as you'd expect, as soon as he's released, he starts his drug use, he starts his violence with immediate effect, immediate effect. So by November 2006, Burton, along with a friend, they start carrying out these armed attacks on local drug dealers. So they go and take their money or they take their drugs and they have this idea that they want to start this drugs empire. Now, the first of these attacks occurred on the 14th of November. This is where he had a firearm and he also wore a stab-resistant vest, meaning that he's clearly ready for a fight. The second took place on the 19th of November. That's when a methamphetamine dealer was attacked with a knife and a gun. On the 21st of November, Burton and his associate attacked another meth dealer. They broke his ribs, they knocked him unconscious. And then on the 22nd of November, Burton and his associate attacked a drug dealer using weapons. These guys are prolific. Then on the 23rd, yes, a whole 24 hours after the 22nd, they attacked a group of dealers and at this point they were wearing balaclavas. Then on the 24th of November, probation, who were already concerned about the fact that Burton is out, they received information that Burton was meeting a man who was on parole after murdering someone. Now that means he's in breach of the terms of his parole. They also informed probation that Burton was attending strip clubs with this man. Now, that same day, police were informed that a man was being attacked by three men. And when they attended the scene, they actually witnessed Burton fleeing as a passenger in a car with two other men. Then, when they searched the car, they found balaclavas and a large hunting knife. Now, the police are learning all of this information through informants, of course which is what they require. They've got people on the street who are criminals who know what's playing out and are obviously giving information to the police and they're forming this picture that they have a real problem with Burton. The police then go and speak to one of Burton's associates and he said that the police should actually be thanking them rather than reprimanding them. I kid you not. He literally said, we're doing you guys a favour. We've been getting rid of a lot of gear off the streets. Crime rates must have been dropping because of us. Now, I don't think that's how it works. Just going to throw it out there, you know. Um, we're really concerned about the fact that you have been going around and robbing drug dealers and clearly trying to build some kind of kingpin industry where you're in charge. Yeah, well, you know what, mate? Realistically, I've been doing you a favour. I've been doing you a favour because we've been working together to get rid of all the others. So there's just us. You'll only have to deal with us. <laughs> Not sure. Sorry, my accent's gone really bad there. I'm just not, I apologise. I'm, I'm not sure that's how it works, mate. I think you'll find it's a legal activity, no matter what. And as for crime rates dropping, no, we've got loads of reports of these guys being beaten almost to death by a group of rampaging drug dealers they want to take over. I apologise for those accents. I'm not very good today, but nonetheless, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous that Burton and his friends seem to think that because they're doing loads of crimes, they're actually reducing the crimes in the area. But, you know, psychopathologic and all that. So the police are obviously 100% aware that this is just a nightmare, that they really have a big problem on their hands and they want Burton to be recalled to custody. So on the 25th of November, they speak to probation and say, look, you need to get him back into custody. He's committing so many crimes. The crimes are increasing and also the violence within them is increasing. 
The police are also being told as well by informants that Burton is basically preventing low-level drug dealers from making any complaints against him because he's taxing and assaulting them. So he's basically stealing from them, robbing them, and then beating them up and threatening them. So even though they're having crimes committed towards them, they don't want to tell the police, they don't want to engage because they fear for their lives. And the police were also informed that Burton had been sourcing meth from drug dealers and then refusing to pay them. He is somebody who genuinely has no conscience, but also just has no fear. He's placing himself in the line of fire and he isn't concerned. He's willing to go further than anyone else to get what he wants. On November the 27th, this is when the police sent a probation report about all of Burton's crimes. They responded with, I have a bad feeling about all of this. Without charges, we will not be able to recall. At the first sign of charges being laid, we will make an application for immediate recall. So it sounds at that moment as if probation is saying, look, we know, we get it. But until somebody actually comes forward and makes a complaint, he hasn't necessarily broken the conditions that will mean that he should be recalled. But again, surely a drugs test would be enough to get him recalled because this guy is obviously using again and that will definitely go against his parole conditions. But we get to November the 28th. At this point, a detective sergeant is assigned to be the head of an operation to set up and specifically find Burton because he is at this point deemed to be a danger to the public. They then go and search Burton's home and also his associates' homes. This is on the 30th of November, and this is because they want to try to locate a weapon. He isn't at home at the time, and unfortunately the firearm that they're looking for isn't actually found. Probation then asked the police if they would put the information they had on Burton into an affidavit to aid them in an application for his recall because they didn't have this information that was enough without this to get that to happen. But police denied this request, and the reason for that is their intelligence had actually come from an informant. And if the informant's identity was exposed, that informant would be at risk. And also it would mean that the police lost an important informant who was probably giving them information on lots of criminals. So that particular person required protection. But this is horrific because it means that we're not moving where Burton is concerned and he is certainly a risk, not only to drug dealers, but to anybody essentially who crosses his path, which will become evident very shortly in this case. Now from the 5th of December 2006, Burton just stops attending the scheduled weekly meetings with his parole officer. He's just like, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go anymore. Now bear in mind, he's on a life license. He is meant to be supervised constantly. The meetings were mandatory as part of his parole conditions. So it seems that Burton no longer feels that he has to be beholden to the parole conditions. And that could be for two reasons. It could be because he's just genuinely arrogant. He doesn't want to waste his time doing it. It could also be that he's spiraling. He's starting to become more and more violent. He's aware that potentially he's going to get put back in prison and that stress is making him want to go on the run and is also making him definitely more dangerous. Later that same week, when all this is going on behind the scenes, he threatens to kill someone with a gun and informants then are telling the police that Burton is constantly using methamphetamine. It's found that he's moved out of his house, the one that he'd been living at, and again, this had been a condition of his release, that he remained there, so now they don't know where he is. We get to December the 19th, 2006. There's an application for his arrest for failing to comply with the conditions of his release. And then on December the 22nd, 2006, there's actually a warrant finally issued to arrest Burton for breaching the terms of his parole. However, that warrant wasn't actually collected until December the 27th. And it was on December the 29th, 2006, that a second warrant was issued for Burton's arrest, this time by the parole board with an interim recall order. So this was faxed to the police, but that meant it wasn't actually processed until January the 1st. So it's only then that police officers could start actively to begin looking for Burton, which is a real failure when you think about the kind of person Burton is. He is dangerous beyond belief, and all of this time is passing, which firstly means that Burton can flee, which makes it more difficult, of course, for the police to manage the situation full stop. And also there's all that opportunity for him to spend time offending and offending at an even higher level than before. 
At this point, the police officers were actually unaware that there was a warrant for his arrest in existence until the 1st of January 2007. So they hadn't been hunting for him. So basically, that warrant had been served on the 22nd of December, but nobody knew about it properly until the 1st of January, and that's when they start the hunt. Now, on January the 3rd, 2007, Burton, as you would expect, is carrying on committing crimes. He commits another armed assault with an associate. They break into an apartment. They seriously assaulted the resident with a bat and they threatened to kill him with a gun. And the media are now putting it out that he is on the run and that he is armed and that he is dangerous and that people should be on the lookout for this particular individual. Then on January the 4th, 2007, all Wellington City Police officers are instructed to be armed and to wear body armour because of the safety issues that Burton is causing. Then we get to the 6th of January 2007. In the afternoon, Burton's been dropped off by a friend in an area between Wainamata and Lower Hut. He was basically hiding in some fire breaks to avoid police capture. So fire breaks are barriers against the spread of fire. They're basically strips of empty land between woodland or grassland. And he's hiding in that area. He's wearing a stab-resistant vest because clearly he's expecting a fight. He also had with him a selection of weapons, including a sawn of maverick shotgun, a revolver, extra ammunition, a large hunting knife, which he'd actually strapped to his leg. He also had a pocket knife and a police-style baton. So his intention wasn't just about hiding, was it? You know, when I think about going on the run from the police and not wanting to get involved in any kind of altercation, I'm not thinking about, I don't know, dressing as an action man from 1980 with all of the accessories. At the end of the day, you're not thinking in that context if you're on the run and you're not intending to get into any violent situations. When you have literally covered your body in weaponry, it's because you're looking for a fight and you're certainly expecting a fight and you certainly ain't gonna go down without a fight. The fact that he's wearing protective gear demonstrates that he's intending to get in close proximity, I would say, with other human beings and not in a positive way. Carl Kutchenbecker is a complete innocent bystander in this madness that's playing out. Carl is a 26-year-old father of two. All he's doing is riding his quad bike along the fire break. It's only a few short minutes away from his house in Wainamata. He had left his home around 3.30 p.m. to ride his bike. He's just going about his business. As I said, a father to two. Around 5 p.m., unfortunately for him, in that sliding doors moment, his path crosses with Burton. And Burton just shoots him, knocks him off his bike. At this point, a bewildered, shocked, confused, horrified Carl lies injured on the floor, processing what the hell has just happened. And then he gets shot twice more at close range. Those two shots hit his left arm and his right hand. And that indicates that it was very likely he was trying to defend himself at the time of those shots coming. Carl, in spite of this, probably due to the adrenaline, was somehow able to stand up despite the awful injuries he'd suffered and despite the ongoing attack. But at this point, Burton brandishes the hunting knife and just repeatedly stabbed Carl. Carl fell to the ground once again. He had a punctured right lung. That was the most serious injury from these stab wounds. And then as he lay on his back on the floor, totally defenseless, Burton stabbed him a final time in the center of his chest. The stabbing motion was executed with so much power that the knife went up through his chest cavity, into his right lung and through to his spine. Understandably, Carl succumbed to those many injuries and it was later determined that it was the final thrust of that knife which caused his death. It is harrowing to imagine that the prediction of Burton's original victim's sister is playing out in absolute technicolour. A man who was just a father of two going about on his quad bike with no relationship to Burton is now dead and has died in the most grotesque of manners, in the most terrifying of manners, because this man, this predator, this killer has been allowed on the loose. Now, not content with just murdering Carl, Burton is going to continue this rampage because he's fueled, he's ready. He's completely prepared for this fight. 
He's looking to do as much damage as possible. This isn't just about Burton being out of control. This is about Burton teaching society a lesson. We've let him go. He's laughing at us. He's taking full advantage and he's going to do as much damage as is humanly possible before he's brought to justice. Now, a few minutes after he killed Carl, a couple of mountain bikers passed him. This is Jeremy Simpson and a guy called Carl Holmes. Now, Jeremy Simpson actually recognized Burton as being the wanted man. He then sees the body of Carl just a few moments later on, and then he realizes this has got to be the criminal that the police are searching for. Jeremy sensibly speeds up to get away from Burton because he saw that he was also carrying a gun. But Burton is on to Jeremy and he fires a shot at him. He hits him in the left elbow. But fortunately, Jeremy manages to get around the corner. Then he falls off his bike. Carl, who's just a further bit behind Jeremy, hears Burton reload the gun as he passes him and he gets shot in the left arm and left side. But again, fortunately, because they were shot at a distance of around 20 metres, they both fortunately aren't hitting areas that are fatal. So they both at this point have fell off the bikes and they run. But they're also very relieved at this moment that Burton has not immediately followed them. Now, as the two men are running away, another two mountain bikers were coming towards Burton. This is Nicholas Ree and his 18-year-old daughter, Kate. Burton has climbed onto Carl's quad bike at this point. It's believed that the reason that he did that is he's going to go and follow Jeremy and Carl because... Basically, he probably wants to kill them as quickly as possible. But these two new mountain bikers interrupt that situation. So then Nicholas and Kate, the new mountain bikers, they notice Carl clutching Becker's body and stop because initially they're thinking this man's injured. So he asks Burton what has happened. And Burton says, well, there's been an accident. So at this point, Nicholas, understandably, he hasn't worked out the, the reason that Carl is on the floor in this state is because he's been mercilessly attacked by Burton. So he starts calling emergency services. But then Burton just punches him in the face and says, no cell phones. Then he just shows him this large knife that he used in the murder. So at this point, of course, Nicholas like, here, have the phone. Burton then throws it into a bush and then instructs Nicholas to start the quad bike. Now, Nicholas at this moment is dealing with the horror that's unfolding in front of him. He's also got to think about the fact he's got an 18-year-old daughter that he wants to protect and he's got no bloody idea how to start the quad bike. So he's saying, I don't know, I don't know how to do this, but he's trying his best because he's obviously going to try to please Burton. And Burton says, you better get it started your life depends on it. So he's trying to start the bike and Burton's threatening at this moment in time. He's saying it looks as though someone's already died. We better make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. Burton tells him that he's got a gun that he's taking it out of his bag and it actually went off. And when it went off, it fires into the ground near Kate and the pellets ricocheted and hit her. Now at this point, Burton bizarrely says he's sorry. He said he hadn't put the safety catch on and he'd shot her by accident in that way. Nicholas all the while is desperately trying to start the quad now thinking that he and his daughter's life are imminently in serious danger but because he can't get that quad started Burton takes the mountain bike and then just cycles in the direction that Jeremy and Carl had fled. Now it's interesting that he doesn't kill the two mountain bikers who've stopped and actually tried to help him start the quad because they have seen him. They've seen the fact there is a man murdered. They can identify him. But maybe it's because Nicholas was entirely compliant during that experience. Maybe it's because Nicholas is with a younger girl. Maybe that's why he doesn't meet the victim profile that Burton is used to. Killing men, that's acceptable, even though we're talking about an innocent father of two. But actually killing a girl in front of a father or a father in front of a daughter, maybe that's something that goes too far even for Burton. I'm not saying that he isn't capable. We know that he's been very violent to his ex, but he's never killed his ex. And to some degree, even though he's threatened to kill his ex and had opportunity to kill his ex, he hadn't done. So maybe there is a slight differentiation psychologically between how he treats males versus how he treats females. Now, the father and daughter at this point, they just run to try and get some help and they get some help from a passing car. The driver calls emergency services for them. 
In the meantime, we have Jeremy and Carl who flee the scene. They've spoken to the ambulance service. They're waiting for a phone call from the police. And then they suddenly realize to the absolute horror that they can see Burton approaching them on a mountain bike in the distance. So at this point, they just kind of jump down a steep hill, hide in some bushes until help arrives, which is exactly what anybody sensible would do. Now, when the police call, they explain what's happened. They say the guy that the police are looking for is the person who was their attacker. So then two police officers attend the scene around 6.30 p.m. Now, shortly after arriving, they hear via their radio that it is likely that Burton is the attacker. They cordon off the area as they would do. They call for backup and they know they need more manpower to cover all of the exit points that Burton can leave from. But also, we probably are in a scenario where we can empathise with the officers being deeply concerned about their own safety. So they then go to the car boot to get the rifles. Those rifles were in a locked container. But as they did this, can you imagine how the stomachs would drop? Burton appears and he's pointing a gun at them. They back off. Of course they do. They call for backup when they see that Burton is there. And they notice that he's now got hold of their police rifle. So basically, the armed police have armed the actual criminal who's at large. So I just turned up. Uh, do you want to take my massively, massively dangerous weapons? Yes, just help yourself, help yourself. That's what happened. One of the officers actually shouted armed police. And at this point, Burton just points the shotgun at him. So the officer who was armed at the time fired his gun at Burton three times. And fortunately, one of the bullets hits Burton in his right upper thigh. Both of the officers at this point then go over and arrest Burton and they actually, as you would expect, give him first aid until the ambulance arrived. Now, as a result of that bullet wound, Burton's leg had to be amputated above the knee. And what is unbelievable to me is he later received a prosthetic leg which cost $10,000. It was paid for by the taxpayers. Is it just me who finds that really concerning that $10,000 was given essentially to him because of an injury that he essentially caused himself. And when you think about the fact that the families of the victims will pay taxes, they will have contributed to that prosthetic leg. I know that we have human rights, but I think people like Burton absolutely should have those rights dissolved. And a source inside the prison said that before he got the prosthetic leg, all the inmates would actually deflate the tires on his wheelchair. And the reason was not because they were bullying him. They wanted to slow him down because he was always attacking people. They actually referred to him as a menacing presence and someone who you could never let your guard down around. Now, understandably, after he's arrested, they have to do an IPCA, an Independent Police Conduct Authority report, because they need to see what the breaches and what the failures were. And they later established in the report that although appropriate action had been taken in shooting Burton, considering the nature of the circumstances, it had concluded that the police didn't respond satisfactorily in response to the issuing of the warrant for his arrest in December 2006. So many officers were not even aware that there was a warrant at all. And this, of course, led to a delay at a time when the search should have been stepped up. However, they did note that from January the 1st, 2007, which is when the police were made aware that there was a recall order and arrest warrant for Burton, the police's response was good. Understandably, when it came down to the court case, Burton did plead guilty to 11 charges because he had to. He was banging to rights and going anywhere, was he? He got charged with one murder, two attempted murders, two aggravated robberies, two of kidnapping, two of using a firearm against a law enforcement officer, aggravated injury and injuring with reckless disregard. He was given a life sentence with a non-parole period of 26 years and also preventative detention. Still, when you consider his crimes doesn't seem long enough, he should never ever walk the streets again. Ever! How could we ever let somebody like Burton walk the streets again? Now, when it comes down to Carl, who was his victim in the events that I've just talked about, the person who luckily did lose their life, he was described as an incredible man, a very nice guy who would do anything to help anyone out and someone who would never hurt a fly. Apparently, he was a committed and loving father to his two sons who meant the world to him. How disgraceful, how reprehensible, how unforgivable 
that that man died because of the failures I just outlined. And because of the failures of that initial parole board, it is heinous. And his crimes don't stop there. Because Burton is a nasty, evil, psychopathic, malevolent force. In December 2008, he attacks another inmate called Dwayne Marsh. He stabbed him 27 times with a sharpened steel rod while he tried to defend himself with a mop. So he has gone out of his way to sharpen that steel rod. He has taken time to premeditate this attack 27 times. One of the wounds actually pierced Dwayne Marsh's heart. Fortunately, emergency surgery was carried out and his life was saved. At this point, Burton was convicted of attempted murder and the judge said he had an unabated propensity for violence. Yeah, I think we all know that by now. I mean, he needed to have that line, an unabated propensity for violence. Of course he had an unabated propensity for violence. He's horrific. And unfortunately, in spite of that attack, he's not going to get any more time in prison. None. Yeah, you can just like go ahead and stab somebody almost to death. And it will not change, in this case, the time that you would spend incarcerated because sentencing law meant that any prison time he was given for this crime would have to be served concurrently. So yeah, how bizarre is it that the judge is like, he has an unabated propensity for violence. So what are we looking at with the sentencing guidelines? We're going to give him a very strong sentence. Brilliant. When are we going to do that? Well, now. How long? A lot of years. Are there any captures? Because I'm sensing you delaying telling me. Well, we're going to give him quite a few years, but they're going to be served at the same time as the years that he's got inside. So no years. Well, they are years. They're just, they're served concurrently. Can we not do consecutively? No, sadly we can't. Anyway, that's what happened. So he was going to be given it to serve concurrently instead of consecutively, meaning just crack on, attempt to murder a few other people. Not going to make a big difference to your case, is it? So yeah, he got absolutely no extra time whatsoever, which is utterly blindsiding to somebody like me because I sit there and I think to myself, that's just going to be absolutely devastating for the family, both of those people that he's already killed, but also for the individual who is very badly harmed in the attack. Then in 2010, a homemade pocket knife is found inside a fan in Burton's prison cell. So again, this is something that's premeditated and staff were understandably reprimanded for this because the whole premise of him being kept in prison is that as part of his management plan is that he required daily cell searches, which is a no brainer. And officers had literally been signing to say that these were conducted. So they were going ahead and signing their name against the sheet saying, yeah, We've definitely checked his cell. You know, this guy who sharpens metal rods and all but kills people and has been absolutely horrific in his past. We've definitely checked, apart from he hadn't. So anyway, he could have killed other people if he had been able to use that weapon. And again, it just shows such a lack of care and understanding when it comes down to the gravity and the propensity of violence this particular individual carries within their body. He could be out killing anybody on the wing with that kind of weapon, and yet they were just lying and saying they checked his cell. Then we get to May the 11th, 2018, and I would say this is where Burton may get a taste of his own medicine. So he gets attacked by three inmates and he actually received life-threatening injuries. A guy called Suwaki Lisiate, who was a senior Crips member, was also in prison for murder. He stabbed Burton over 40 times using two knives and Burton received a really large wound to his right eye as well as many other injuries. He did make a recovery, but apparently his eye injury left him with severely diminished vision in that eye. Lisiate pleaded guilty to causing grievous bodily harm as he would do. He probably found out that he wouldn't get any more time for just going about and normal killing somebody else, you know? Probably uh, they'd just get a concurrent sentence. So what is the point of not doing if you have that murderous intention within you? Just pick somebody you don't like and hack them to pieces. Anyway, the reason that apparently the attack occurred is that Lizzie had said that he'd heard that Burton was planning to attack him. So he'd basically chosen to strike first. Justice Benning, actually said that though Burton may be a violent man on this occasion, at the time when the attack occurred, there'd been no threat to Lizzie He was then sentenced to preventative detention. So again, 
not exactly a huge threat to his future release, I would say. I think Lizzie A probably just got the memo that you can act in a reprehensible way and pretty much get away with it when it comes down to whilst you're incarcerated. Now, Burton is a man, I would say, when you consider his crimes, he just chooses his victims at random. The unpredictability is what makes him so terrifying. He's got no clear motive. He just apparently likes engaging in violence. And it's crazy to me that he was ever released in the first place, especially when he has a drug problem that was huge and it was never dealt with in prison. We know drugs exacerbate violent tendencies. And it just seemed like such a clear threat to the public when he was let out of prison. It's reported that around 90% of prisoners in New Zealand have issues with drugs or alcohol and apparently treatment for this is often not received. Around 57% of people with previous convictions are reconvicted within two years after leaving prison. It's little consolation as well that he will be incarcerated for the foreseeable future because he will be eligible for parole in 2033. He'll only be 62 years of age. There's a hell of a lot of offending you can do after 62 years of age. And what's really galling is, whilst he might get to walk free, we have to be aware that Carl's death could have been prevented if the right steps had been taken regarding the initial parole decision and then the warrant for his arrest. And that because of the poor decisions that played out, it's led to two little boys having to grow up without their dad. And it's clear that he hasn't changed his ways in prison just by the conduct that I've shared with you today. Also, when you think about somebody like Graham Burton, you can't help but consider that he is a stone cold psychopath. And when it comes down to psychopaths, the truth is that when they go to prison, particularly when they spend time on violent wings in prison with other violent offenders, they basically go to university for psychopaths. They learn to out-psychopath the next psychopath. They come out as bigger con artists, bigger manipulators, more violent human beings. They're much more ready to use intimidation and violence and destruction to achieve whatever goals they have. That's why we see reoffending at such a high rate in violent perpetrators because many of them are hardwired psychopaths and that genuinely means that until we change the system that is meant to be there to change them we will not receive any change and these crimes will keep being committed. Graham Burton is somebody who loves to kill, maybe even was born to kill and society will never be safe when individuals with his nature are allowed to walk the streets freely. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case. Are you as frustrated as me? It's inconceivable that time and time again we cover the mistakes that are laid bare in these cases, but laid bare far too late at the cost of incalculable pain and loss to the families of the victims who were left behind. Take care guys, as ever. I'll see you next time. Look after yourselves.